A warning for listeners. Throughout this podcast, we have original audio from 9-11, plus recreations of that day. We feel it is important for listeners to hear, but it can also be disturbing. For 20 years, we've shorthanded the site of the fourth crash on September 11th as Shanksville. But that's not really accurate. The plane came down in Stony Creek Township. That's a nearby part of the small rural communities that make up Somerset County, Pennsylvania. Stony Creek Township is about 90 minutes outside Pittsburgh, and all of the local communities there found themselves called to respond on the morning of 9-11. Denise Miller that day was a sergeant with the neighboring Indian Lake Police Department. Today, she's retired and still lives nearby. Well, at Indian Lake, you pretty much were part of the community and knew them well. And um, as you did your patrols, you watched the homes and such, and you could even soon get used to what even their bedtime was. That morning, Denise was at home just starting her day. I had just gotten up, and I was just sitting in front of the TV watching... um, the news report today, the Today Show. And um, I was eating a bowl of cereal, and that's when I saw the first jet come in and crash into the tower. Told that a plane, some reports are that it was a small commuter plane, crashed into the upper floors of one of the twin towers. You can see fire and flames. And then the second jet hit. There were many people in the building. Oh, another one just hit. Something else just hit. A very large plane oh. just flew directly over my building, and there's been another collision. Can you see it? I yeah. And then by that, the phone rang, and it was 911. And I'm very familiar with all the dispatchers up there at that time. And um, JJ, he said that you have a plane down, D. And I said, what, like a Cessna or something? I said, because we do have an airport up there, did have an airport. Lots of times they would lose track of a plane, and so we'd have to start checking the area. But he said, no, you have a big plane. That's when it just hit my brain. Another hijacked plane, the fourth that day, had crashed only minutes away near the small town of Shanksville. And so when he started explaining the area that it came down in, uh, I knew exactly where he was talking about the old strip cut. So I just hopped in my uniform and headed out to work, grabbed a cruiser. And the first person I met on the Lambertsville Road was a trooper that I knew. And I asked him how many people were in the plane, and he said they thought it was like 364 people. So at that point, I was left in, and the public was already lined up on the uh, roadway. And already EMTs were there and other officers, and um, there was this big mound of dirt and there was much debris, but it wasn't any, most of the debris was just the size of a quarter or somebody's clothing. The EMTs were walking around crying because they had found out that there were no survivors, so they were very upset. And at the same time, we were constantly putting out small fires. The uh, fire department, Shanksville, had tanks on their back and they kept hitting, had, had to hit the hot spots to get the fire out, and you could see Down through the woods that I was familiar with, the uh, scorched pines and trees. The one thing I did experience was an officer that I knew. He had 35 years of experience, and he was a kind of a tough cookie. And he came up, and he was snow white. And I couldn't figure out, and I said to him, I said, What's down there, Tom? He said, whatever you do, don't go down into the woods. The jet fuel, that was almost overpowering. Um, Burning flesh, that was a smell I never had smelled before. Miller wasn't sure what she was looking at. A giant gash on the site of a reclaimed strip mine. It was just after 10 a.m., and smoke still poured out over the scene. Sergeant Miller says she wasn't scared of the fires that raged in the surrounding trees or the horrific remains of the crash that surrounded her. What bothered her, she says, was that she didn't know what was going to happen next. 
I was frightened because there we were standing where a plane came down and I was wondering why would a plane dive into this ground and I was thinking does the government have something underneath that they were trying to get to that we're not even aware of and I was fearful of another plane coming in. She was worried the terrorists would strike again like they had with the World Trade Center. Of course, her fear sounds strange today, but that's only because we know the rest of the story. On September 11, 2001, we were still in the early fog of a war on terror. And all we knew was the nation's most high-profile buildings were under attack. Claire, let me interrupt you for a second. We now have fire confirmed at the Pentagon. And parts of the Pentagon are indeed being evacuated. I remember thinking the first one was likely an accident, the second one was an attack, and the third plane was a declaration of war. Two planes had rammed into the World Trade Center, a third smashed into the Pentagon, and now a fourth had dived into this field in rural Pennsylvania. Why? I'm Garrett Graff a journalist, historian, and author of the New York Times best-selling book, The Only Plane in the Sky, an Oral History of 9-11. I've spent much of the last two decades studying and reporting on that tragedy and how it changed our world. But as we near the 20th anniversary of the attacks, it's clear that many people still don't understand what happened that day. From Long Lead and Goat Rodeo, this is Long Shadow, a podcast about the enduring mysteries and lingering questions of 9-11. Episode 2, how a delayed flight and nervous calls from passengers turned into one of the day's most historic moments. Today, we'll tackle the question on 9-11 that I get from readers and audiences more than any other. It's a question that in all likelihood we will never fully answer. But it's the same question that was on Sergeant Denise Miller's mind that Tuesday morning in Pennsylvania. What was the target of United Airlines Flight 93? Where was it headed? And how did it end up here? Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This will serve as a gate change announcement for all customers traveling on a regional flight DY-71. While much has changed since 9-11, one thing is the same. There are always massive delays at New York area airports. The first three hijacked flights from Dulles International and Boston Logan took off on time that Tuesday morning. But at Newark International Airport, the starting point for Flight 93, the plane started the day running late. The Boeing 757 had a light load just seven crew members and 37 passengers, including the four would-be hijackers. Boarding Flight 93 were people like First Officer Leroy Homer and Cece Lyles, a 33-year-old flight attendant from Florida. People like Mark Bingham, a 31-year-old PR executive. Todd Beamer, a father of three. And Donald and Jean Peterson, a retired couple on their way to visit Yosemite National Park. That morning, Flight 93 didn't take off until 8.42, about 40 minutes late. That delayed departure would turn out to be very important. It would change the course of the entire day. This story would be much shorter and more tragic without it. As Flight 93 rose into the sky, just across the Hudson River from New York City, the hijackers aboard another plane, American Airlines Flight 11, were already bearing down on Manhattan. Four minutes later, at 8.46, that aircraft would crash into the North Tower of the World Trade Center. As FAA and airline officials on the ground pieced together the first two hijackings, they sent out a warning to the other pilots in the air. Watch out for cockpit intrusions. Lock your doors. By 9.28, 
two of the other hijacked planes had already reached their targets in New York City, and a third was headed for the Pentagon. We don't know exactly what unfolded next on United Airlines Flight 93, but what we do know is that the hijackers, sitting in first class, attacked the flight crew. Then, air traffic controllers got several brief calls from the cockpit. Negative contact, we're looking at United 93. Hey! 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 That's American 1060. Hey! The plane took a sharp nosedive, descending about 600 feet in less than a minute. Those watching on the radar scopes were confused. Over the radio, they heard screaming, and they tried to contact the plane again. Somebody call Cleveland. United 93, Cleveland. Go ahead, Frankie. Do you have United 93 south of Shark? We hear some funny noises. We're trying to get him. Do you have him? No. Thank you. United 93, Cleveland. Minutes later, at 9.32, they finally heard from the cockpit again. But now it was the unfamiliar voice of Ziad Jara, one of the two hijackers now at the plane's controls. The other hijackers herded the passengers to the back of the hijacked plane. Huddled over cell phones, several passengers and crew called family and friends on the ground. Flight 93's delayed departure from the airport that morning gave them something no other victims had on 9-11. Knowledge. They, unlike almost anyone else that day, understood what was going on. That extra sliver of time they spent on the tarmac in Newark meant that later, they had time to hear from loved ones about what was transpiring across the country. Flight 93's passengers were told about the planes that had already struck the World Trade Center and the Pentagon. But flight attendant Cece Lyles couldn't reach her husband. Tuesday, 9.47 a.m. Hi, baby. I'm, baby, you have to listen to me carefully. I'm on a plane that's been hijacked. I'm on the plane, I'm calling from the plane. I want to tell you I love you. Please tell my children that I love them very much. And I'm so sorry, babe. Um, I don't know what to say. There are three guys. They've had that plane. I'm trying to be calm. We're turned around. And I've heard that there's planes that have been, been flown into the World Trade Center. I hope to be able to see your face again, baby. I love you. Bye. End of message. Mark Bigham, the PR executive, called his mother, Alice Hoagland. She spoke to CBS News the night of September 11th. And uh, I got on the phone. <laughs> I heard Mark's voice. He said, Mom, this is Mark Bingham. <laughs> he was so uh, flustered, I guess, giving me his last name. <laughs> and uh, he said, I just wanted to let you know that I love you. He was repeating that. I told him, we love you, Mark. And, and uh, he said, I'm on a flight. And uh, there are three guys that have taken over the flight, and they say they have a bomb. Todd Beamer was on the Verizon airphone in the back of the plane trying to place a call to the ground. He got routed to an airphone operator, Lisa Jefferson. Beamer told her that a group of the passengers and crew were going to try and take back control of the cockpit. Here's Lisa Jefferson later speaking to CNN's Larry King. Ty was very calm when I took the call over. I had asked him did he want me to place his call through to his wife for him. He told me that he didn't want me to put him through to her in case he didn't have to. Did you tell him about the World Trade Center and the Pentagon? No, I did not because I didn't know at that time. You didn't know? No. So you're totally in the dark here. Correct. You're talking to a man on a hijacked plane. And you recited the Lord's Prayer with him? Yes, we recited the Lord's Prayer. And that just gave him the strength and the courage to do what he needed to do. Because at that point, he had told me that they all had a plan. Beamer, Bingham, and the rest of the passengers and crew understood that their fate was probably already sealed. Their opportunity that day was not going to be to save their own lives. It was going to be to save other lives. 
And with that knowledge, they bravely decided to do something that few else that morning could do. They fought back and stormed the cockpit, armed with their fists, a coffee pot, and whatever else the crew could gather. Once again, we don't know exactly what transpired, but a recorder in the cockpit caught the revolt. Even two decades later now, only the transcript has ever been publicly released. At 9.57, the passengers charged the hijackers guarding the cockpit in first class. Between the sounds of screams and shattered glass, Ziad Jara, who was piloting the plane, can be heard asking what was going on. Was there a fight outside? He asks another hijacker to hold the door. Air traffic controllers at this point get reports from a nearby commercial plane that Flight 93 was moving erratically. Looks like he's deployed his gear. I'm sorry, say again? I said it looks like he's deployed the gear. He deployed his landing gear, sir? It looks like it. Okay, what's he doing now, sir? It appears that he might be turning a little to the north. Is that, does that concur? That's concurred. Uh, it looks like he's rocking his wings, uh, according to my observer. Roger. He's rocking back and forth. At 10 a.m., one hijacker in Flight 93's cockpit asked the other, Is that it? Shall we finish it off? A passenger charging the door can be heard faintly. In the cockpit, they said. If we don't, we'll die. Then the hijackers gave one final command. Put it down. And at 10.03 a.m., United Airlines Flight 93, in the skies over Somerset County, took its last fatal dive. The recorder caught the final jumbled words from what must have been a chaotic and crowded cockpit. One was a voice in Arabic reciting, God is greatest, Alu Akbar, nine times. Then another voice. In English, someone screams, no. I also want to give you a head heads up, Washington. Go ahead. United 9-3, have you got information on that yet? Yeah, he's down. He's down? Yes. When did he land? Because we he, have information. He, he, did, he did not land. Oh, he's down? Yeah, Bottom? somewhere up northeast of Camp David. The hijacker's final words are not what people remember from Flight 93. Instead, it's the actions of the passengers and crew on board that day that became the first rallying cry of the post 9-11 era. But we're still left wondering, before they fought back, where exactly was United Airlines Flight 93 headed? Whose lives did the passengers and crew save that day? As the Twin Towers fell in New York City, smoke also filled the air over Washington, D.C., where another hijacked airliner had struck the Pentagon. Hijackers had destroyed twin beacons of the U.S. economy and deeply damaged the home of our nation's military. What was next? People assumed the White House and the U.S. Capitol building were potential targets. And in fact, those buildings have become part of our modern narrative of 9-11. The terrorists on Flight 93 had a fourth target in mind was called our nation's capital. They were just 20 minutes away from reaching their sinister objective. Some of the lawmakers who were in the Capitol building on September 11th, including then Congressman Mike Pence, proudly claimed the passengers and crew of Flight 93 saved their lives. He spoke at Shanksville in 2017. I found myself just across the street from the U.S. Capitol eventually. Shortly after I arrived, the chief of police set the phone back down and informed the leaders gathered there that there was a plane inbound to the Capitol, and he said it was 12 minutes out. I found myself looking out the window, where just across the street was the Capitol Dome, a dome that's a, a symbol of the ideals of this nation, of freedom and democracy. So we waited. 
It was the longest 12 minutes of my life, but it turned to 13 minutes, then 14. And then we were informed that the plane had gone down in a field in Pennsylvania. The theory that the U.S. Capitol building was the terrorist target holds up. During interrogation at Guantanamo Bay, 9-11 planner Khalid Sheikh Mohammed said Flight 93 was aimed at the Capitol. That said, intelligence experts have cast serious doubts on the military and CIA interrogation methods and how much trust we should put in the answers. The White House seems to be the most obvious target for terrorists. It's the iconic home office to our nation's most powerful executive. And oddly enough, someone did try to hit the building with a plane almost exactly seven years before 9-11. Extraordinary breach of security. Early this morning, a plane, a small plane, crashing on the south lawn of the White House. There was some damage to the White House. President Clinton and family were not in the White House at the time. For more on the story, we go to ABC's Ann Compton. And do we know whether this was a terrorist attack, an attack designed to harm the president? That is always what the White House Secret Service presumed. Here's what happened. A 38-year-old truck driver from Maryland named Frank Eugene Corder was at the end of his rope. The New York Times later reported he told friends he was depressed over losing his business and marriage after a line of drug and assault charges. So on the night of September 11th, 1994, he broke into a small county airport and stole a Cessna 150, a light two-seat aircraft, and embarked on his own suicide mission. His plan was to die in spectacular fashion by crashing the plane into the White House. A source says radar picked up the plane seven miles from the White House as it headed south, bypassed the building, then made a U-turn and crashed on the South Lawn. We take this incident seriously because the White House is the people's house. And it's the job of every president who lives here to keep it safe and secure. Even in 1994, rumors of the White House's air defense were scattered and unconfirmed. ABC News reported that there were Stinger missile launchers on the roof, and snipers were supposed to be positioned to take out rogue pilots. But none of those things stopped Corder's plane. Luckily, he crashed just short of the building, killing only himself. And so what worries officials more than anything is that an incident like this exposes to everyone the limitations of the security net surrounding the White House and the president. Frank Eugene Corder's flight has gone largely forgotten because he didn't reach his target either. And it's not hard to see why. The building is mostly hidden from the sky. It stands just four stories tall and is surrounded on three sides by taller buildings nestled among the trees. So to hit the building's only open section, the South Lawn, Flight 93's hijackers would have had to bank and turn a massive Boeing 757, an aircraft designed to move at hundreds of miles per hour. The small plane that Corder wrecked on the White House lawn was slow and light enough to make that sharp U-turn the same turn that Flight 93's Boeing 757 may have struggled to make. So if the question is, what was Flight 93's target, it's possible that the answer is anything it could hit. The hijackers may have intended to first try to strike the White House, and if they couldn't line up the aircraft, they would aim for the easy-to-spot capital instead. Bits and pieces of the answer have been offered over the years. We know Osama bin Laden was eager to destroy the symbols of American power. The visual of a destroyed White House or Capitol would have had immense damage to the American psyche. It's hard to even imagine what the DC skyline would look like without that bright white Capitol dome. It would be a scar just as visible as the Twin Towers missing from Manhattan. But the terrorists didn't necessarily view the buildings as interchangeable. In fact, Al-Qaeda viewed the two as quite different. According to a CIA official who appeared before the 9-11 Commission, the U.S. Capitol was viewed by terrorists as the source of the U.S. policy that supported Israel, while the White House was considered to be a political symbol. 
Ultimately, the 9-11 Commission never settled on the likely destination for the hijackers of United Airlines Flight 93. FBI Special Agent Jackie McGuire was the Bureau's lead investigator of the 9-11 attacks. Through our investigation and through interviews that have been conducted, uh, it appeared Flight 93's intended target was the U.S. Capitol in Washington, D.C. Osama bin Laden's preferred target has been disputed, and Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, the so-called mastermind behind the 9-11 plot, reportedly said that the final decision was, quote, entirely in the hands of the pilot. We now know he was wrong. Whatever the hijacker's target for Flight 93 was, they didn't reach it, because the final decision wasn't in their hands. The final fate of the plane was in the hands of people like Todd Beamer, the father of three, whose last known words went to air phone operator Lisa Jefferson. When he told the guys, are you ready? I assumed that they were waiting on his cue. And he said, okay, let's roll. Next time, we'll head to Washington, D.C. for one of the darkest moments of 9-11, a moment when Flight 93 was still in the air and presumed to be headed to Washington. Then someone gave the order to U.S. fighter pilots, shoot the plane down. Yeah, and it's a presidential level decision, and the president uh, made, I think, exactly the right call in this case to say, I wished we'd had combat air patrol up over New York. But did the president make that call? Or did Vice President Cheney do it himself? Long Shadow is a production from Goat Rodeo and Long Lead. You can find it wherever you get your podcasts. Go ahead and rate the show and leave us a review. It helps spread the word. I'm your host, Garrett Graff. Long Shadow's lead producer is Max Johnston. John Patrick Pullen is the show's executive producer. The episode was written by me and Max. Story editing from Morgan Springer. Editorial support from Dan Eisner, Diana Albasha, and Owen O'Carroll. Senior producers at Goat Rodeo are Megan Nadalski and Ian Enright. Rebecca Seidel is managing producer. Music from Blue Dot Sessions and Ian Enright. Podcast artwork by Emily Crawford. Longlead's creative director is Natalie Matuszewski. And a thanks to ABC, CBS, NBC, PBS, C-SPAN, and the 9-11 Memorial and Museum for some of the archival audio you hear on the show.